<laughs> Aloha, everyone. Oh, okay. Hello. Great. From all corners of the planet, and heights and depths. <laughs> Aloha. <clears throat> Getting to see you is so wonderful. Oregon, Vermont, yeah. British Columbia. Mm. Massachusetts, Maui. <laughs> Ah, how wonderful. All over New England. <laughs> and all the nice animals. Lassie. <laughs> Lovely smiles. Colors and contours. Well, as you look into the community and the sacred places where each of us dwell, just noticing the body from within the body as you sit or stand or kneel or lie down. Notice the body, notice the mental mood, inclination of heart, intention you may have with this uh, practice session. Perhaps leading in with some metta, friendliness, goodwill, kindness on a cellular level to our own body, starting at the solar plexus, moving through the body, and like a warm shawl, smooth and silky, holding us in this uh, cocoon of protection of unconditional kindness. and any of the other sister Brahma Viharas, the sweet care of compassion, the spontaneous non-dependent joy arising from connecting with goodness wherever it's felt within and in other beings, near and far. And the stabilizing anchor and balance, evenness of, of equanimity that holds all of them together, that understands, that has the deepest wisdom 
and remembering we, remembering we have these companions always always with us through the journey through the seeing as it is the sixth sense door awareness dhammas appearing and vanishing and that that skill in understanding how mindfulness doesn't attach its nature is simply to see as it is without an agenda, without clinging, without pushing away. And notice it's um, magnetism, how it attracts other skillful states, confidence, courage, uh, a collectedness, concentration. And those precious wisdom, intuitive wisdom, insight moments when they all merge and we see experience, sense and know the nature of arising and passing, the immediacy. Whatever mindfulness touches, it's already vanishing. And sensations and sounds, thoughts, emotions, imaginations. Where, where in, in your bodily experience, and the senses are also the body, visual, the visual palette of color and form, the soundscape, sound vibration. Where in this system of streaming phenomena, physical and mental, do you find a resting place? What now, right now, feels like a safe harbor, a home anchor? Is it the awareness arising within the sitting body formation that feels the array of textures, pressures, oscillations, movement, vibrations? Or a particular area of the body perhaps feels like the touchstone resting place you're looking for, feeling the receptivity, the receptors of the hands and fingers, where there's just always a sensation. And when you look closely, you're liable to attune to the pulsing and vibration temperature ranges, pressures and releases, and the multiple changing textures, gritty and smooth, glassy, rough. And from your resting anchor and the knowledge is there whenever you need it. It's fine to stay abiding with that anchor and watch how the trajectory of the meditative mind unfolds itself. How moments of consecutive mindfulness connecting and sustaining attention with that resting place, anchor, or anything else, 
begins to settle our system, or all of our systems. You might notice first the bodily, the bodily formation begins to drop in to a relaxed place, like little releasing moments, softening moments within the, within the body, felt within the body from this mindful awareness. And also notice with those continuous moments of connecting and sustaining awareness, how the heart mind begins to collect and settle like a still mountain pond, clear and perfectly reflective and how that stillness affects all the mental formations in a way that they too begin to let go into calm. Allow tranquility to interface the thought formations, mental moves. emotions, that even with the edgy ones, difficult ones, there can still, there can still be this canopy of tranquility that holds it so that the whole body, mind, field itself begins to attune just attune just perfect balance in the moment abiding in that moment noticing just what is not what has not yet arisen not following what is past and how profoundly resting that abiding awareness is. Nearly, if not perfectly, nearly precisely balanced, just here, just now. not pulled by what is alluring, not repelled from what is intimidating, threatening, invasive, feeling the tension arc of the various forces, but doing nothing. It's anchored in stillness. Just leaning back, leaning back in this stillness, leaning back in time with patience and watching the play of the sense fields. They move on their own without influence, without desire, without control, without self-referencing, without the me and mine making facility of our discursive awareness. observing the as it is nature. See for yourself what's true.
Michelle, you're muted there. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Thanks, Steve, for the instructions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for me, the uh, autumn equinox has come kind of uh, surprisingly quickly. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we all probably notice in the northern hemisphere, I think those in the southern hemisphere, it's the spring. The spring is um, happening <clears throat> in the autumn. Uh, I think those of us in the north tend to notice that the sun rises uh, later and the sunset is earlier. And it's, it's just like these um, intimations of, of change. And uh, I think all of us will notice um, kind of certain times in our life, which might not be on the date of a solstice or, or an equinox, but we have this experiential um, felt sense of the season change just in a few moments. So for me, last late afternoon, yesterday into the early evening, uh, where I live, the winds really picked up and the uh, clouds just before sunset were just like moving really quickly through the sky and there was like light clouds and dark sky clouds and dark sky and light sky and rain a huge rainbow and it was so much um variation so much change and i noticed that um the wind was so strong but often the the feral cats that um live here uh, don't, they don't like the wind because the predators uh, can get them, right? Like it, they can't hear it, so they tend to hide. But they just love so much that, um, that the feeling, I could tell that we just all stood still and just noticed. It felt that here in this spot on the planet, autumn arrived, you know, just, <laughs> okay, summer's gone. Here it is, even though it will be hot here. Um, it, and this, I think this transition that happens in, in the solstices or equinoxes, um, that we're often in this vast change, living in it, and that it's very natural, but we don't always accept it. Particularly, I think it's easier for us when it goes from spring, for most people, to summer, um, from autumn to winter. It, this it's often harder. Autumn to winter reminds me of a dear friend and family that I have known since I was 11 years old where I grew up in um, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And this um, dear friend, uh, is 84 years old and her and her husband have decided to sell their house. Uh, and it's, it's very intense for me. <laughs> I've, uh, you know, they've been there uh, 59 years and uh, I'm not even the one who's <laughs> moving and I don't live there anymore, but it's just this feeling of like, wow, just, just getting text messages from her that she's shredding this and giving away this. And um, this morning she wrote that uh, she wants to take photos of where the chipmunks live outside her house. So there's, there's holes where the chipmunks lives and the thing that she'd like to bring with her more than anything are the chipmunks. But she can't. Yeah, it's a huge downsizing change. Uh, and I think that that's like, here it is, that the autumn, the autumn winter of the season of her own life and how tied we all are, the, the community of all the beings we know and these, there are the seasons 
of winter, spring, summer, and fall, but there's all the, the seasons of our lives. You know, some people are having children and some people are in midlife. Some people are at the, at the last stages. It's, it's so, um, so much anicca or change. And the, the Buddha taught that if we can uh, stabilize our attention enough, come to certain aspects of stillness and um, apply the uh, mindfulness attention to our moment to moment six store sense store experience that we can come to understand are the three characteristics of existence on deeper and deeper levels. And the first characteristic of existence that we all share, share right? The, the chipmunks, the geckos, the devas, the humans, we all share um, this characteristic of existence of impermanence. And of course, um, the, the impermanence insight or anicca, there's a um, way in which we, as we practice, we see that the second characteristic of existence, dukkha, is, is um, based on this first insight, which is that all experience is unreliable. And that the third, anatta, that all experience is uncontrollable and that nothing exists by itself and that the experience, this, this change, this unreliability, this uncontrollability is, isn't personal. Uh, so I think that um, we often shift from resisting at times these three characteristics uh, so that how we do that is that we might have aversion to pain appearing or we might have attachment to pleasure when it passes is basic, right? But, you know, not denial about um, how things are, all the ways that we uh, find it difficult to be with things as they are. That what, what one aspect of practice is to start to notice that like, say, for example, we're not connected with anicca or impermanence that we're not protected. So, so often there's this shift from um, where we won't feel safe and protected because there's impermanence. When we understand that impermanence is, is just the way things are, and we ex we, whenever we can accept it, we're actually protected. And the same with the other characteristics of existence that when we, um, <laughs> we keep wanting experience to be more reliable or people to be more reliable or dependable. Or we want to be less disappointed by even the human world itself, for example, um, that, that, this, that we will feel unprotected. But actually, if we kind of take to heart what the Buddha was saying, that, the, that all experience is unreliable because it's changing, then if we're connected to that, that we will feel safe and protected because our awareness is infused with understanding. It's infused with wisdom. And the same with the third, which there's a way in which to talk about anatta takes more time than I want to put into it now, but there's a way in which when we understand that what's appearing isn't personal, it's rarely controllable and that nothing exists by itself, then there, there is a way in which, again, that, that of course, very um, human wish to be able to control things more than we can, that, that, that we start to feel more connected because it's how things are with how things aren't as controllable, that again, through that connection with the truth, to the connection with the truth of impermanence, the truth of unreliability, the truth of um, uncontrollability, that we actually are more safe and protected. And why? Because we're not reacting, right? We're not getting all upset and taking 
something that has just changed personally. Um, but of course, at times we do. <laughs> I just um, was minding my own business and standing outside of the post office the other day and um, had pants on, sneakers on, uh, it was windy. Uh, and um, I got a very intense bee sting on my leg. And for me, that's like extra because I'm highly allergic to bees. Um, and so, uh, but often the, f the first thing that will come in, up in my mind is like, why? Like, I'll try to, well, like, why? Why me? Like, I, here I am, <laughs> you know, right? Innocently standing outside, you know, I haven't done anything. Why did I get stung? You know, why didn't that person get stung? There were plenty of people, right? And I didn't even see it. But just the amazing part of like, you know, what, you know, the, the, the um, ramifications for my body is just like, it's just like, you know, I kind of feel like it was like a tiger bit me, not just a bee, but the, 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 the toxicity and the reaction to it within my body. It's like, a, a it has felt like a bonfire and a cannonball are both going on in, in the leg, you know, not much sleep, blah, 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 itchy, you know, but it's just so interesting where, if I'm not accepting that it happened, I'm trying to figure out why, which I'm never going to figure out why, right? It's like impermanent, you know, unreliable, uncontrollable. But I see that when I'm not accepting, in this case, the pain of it, you know, it's, it's uh, talk about restless legs. So I just think it's just a fresh experience of just watching that dance in myself of, it's okay, it's just unpleasant, right? It's just burning, it's just itchy, it's just no sleeping, to why, yeah? And when the why is happening, I'm not protected, I'm not able to be with it, right? And if I'm just like, oh, it's okay that it happened. I, I personally would not have chosen to have it happen. And in fact, when I go there, I probably won't stand in that spot again, right? It's like, a, it was, there's something about that spot that feels not okay, but it's really just conditions, right? Conditions arose and they pass. Hmm. This is from um, the 14th century Chinese hermit stone house translated by Red Pine. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a, a description of samsara. I eat a peach, spit out the pit. The pit becomes a tree. The tree grows and flowers and bears another peach. Spring ends and fall begins. How many times? How can I keep my hair from turning white? how can we keep our hair from turning white, right? It's like so, it's such a beautiful description of like, ah, the peach tree grows and it's all so flowery and wonderful. But then when it comes to our own body, we want to stop it. Yeah. There, it's just that very interesting place of where, where do we see, I know from myself having grown up in New England, um, the beauty of autumn and then just the um, I think when there's that quiet out in the forest and you hear one little part of the leaf fall from the like let separate from the tree branch you can hear it it's like a th yeah very so you have to be so quiet to hear this th and then it just beautifully sways down if the weather's nice and lands and there's this appreciation of the beauty of autumn. 
And then other times it's like, you know, when your body falls apart and it actually isn't going to get better <laughs> for some people when they get old, right? It's like, it doesn't always feel at moments of time as beautiful. But when there's this deep, utter, quiet acceptance, it's even more beautiful. It's the most pe peaceful. Last week when um, Stephen was talking about Deepama and then I was in some question and answer part, I was really tuning in the felt sense of what it felt to be with her. And I, I remember describing her as very still. There was a stillness to her, like the, a mountain lake. But then a few days later, I was um, reflecting on what I said. And I think that uh, I would add to that this uh, vast vast sense of seclusion not just stillness it, it she felt totally protected and totally peaceful there was so much metta but there was also the sense of um if i'm lucky and the weather is clear the clouds are clear i can walk to a place where i live where i see the mauna loa the mountain which is a known as the largest mountain in the world. It's a shield volcano, so often people won't notice actually how large it is. Uh, but I, I have the, the um, if I can every day, I try to feel the felt sense of this mountain because it feels very much like Deepama, very, very much the same as, as the, this incredible, seclusion not just the stillness and i think sometimes um, we forget the intent of stillness or we forget the intent of the solitude it's meant to be a great rest like an incredible rest incredible protection and it's it's out of that stillness or seclusion that we actually can see clearly and i think that again that that we can't we can't connect those dots enough where it's not that we're needing an overabundance of seclusion or stillness but it's that sense of being able if the attention is wandering that it can come back you know and moving it, it, there's something that we come back to that has that sense of, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to feel super remote, <laughs> but it isn't involved in the um, stories so much. So, you know, when Deepama said the mind is made up of stories and we know the body is made up of the four great elements, earth, air, fire, water, it's that sense that there is some seclusion or space within all that that understands that we are not the stories that we are not our bodies so in deep in most case you you could see well oh there's a sense that that seclusion is infused with wisdom and metta yeah that that's possible for us So that seeing things as they are, one avenue of, you know, or one path to access that more can be just a reflection on what mindfulness is. So the intention to understand our experience, the intention to be kind, the intention to understand rather than judge it, this intention to understand rather than judge our experience, can help us get, oh, we're meant to be discerning our experience. We're meant to be attempting to be kind. 
um, so there's that, that we we value <laughs> we begin more and more to value this balance of the stillness or seclusion and seeing things as they are as a way to bring more peace and discernment to our lives so in other words we incline toward more <clears throat> peace with things as they are that that deep um, acceptance of how things are without conditions uh, this is from um, <clears throat> a passage from D.H. Lawrence, the great writer from England, last century. But this moment, I saw the brilliant, proud morning shine high up over the deserts of Santa Fe Something stood still in my soul, and I started to attend. In the magnificent, fierce morning of New Mexico, I sprang awake. I love that description of attending, springing awake. Do you notice if you ever spring awake, right? Attending, attending, just that um, something stood still in his experience. And that can even be a few seconds when we sit down or go for a walk. There, there's a kind of gift in my body being injured because when I walk, I stop a lot and um, I bow <laughs> to add into the um, any resistance to stopping a lot, but I really have learned to, to bow and to stand still for a while. And um, the reason for that is that I always found it harder to feel a kind of stillness and solitude and movement than in, in sitting still or lying or standing still. And I, and I think that to add to um, being with things as they are, uh, in, in a vast solitude, of course, the vastness is including everything. And this is where the practice goes from like the just concentration to the Vipassana and the exploration that happens in our practice. So that in our practice, we're balancing, kind of anchoring the attention at times with the breath, hands, hearing, and then just being with that flow of moment to moment experience, that, um, that vastness of stillness or solitude is meant to include movement. And at some point at times, the stillness and movement just come together so much, there's like this deep flowing of things as they are. And there's no kind of sense of, oh, this stillness movement, you're just in this stillness of movement. <laughs> so to speak. Um, I think that often will appear when we understand that there's nothing to hold on to. When we understand, you know, the, the deep sense of impermanence, and there are times in the practice where we just really can actually not want to hold on. We actually don't want to grasp on to experience because we get how how wonderful peace feels henry david thoreau um, had a great essay on walking and he called it sauntering but i just wanted to read a little bit from it that often isn't read, which is <clears throat> our expeditions are, uh, are but tours. And we come around again at evening to the old hearth side from which we set out. But half the walk is but retracing our steps. You know, and that's 
how much do we do that when we walk, right? We re re -step, retrace our steps to the grocery store, we retrace our steps to the post office or, or our mailbox, or we retraced our steps to the bus or the car, or we retrace our steps to the kitchen sink or to the bathroom. Um, and it is just a tour. And then other times we can kind of stop and go, oh, maybe I can explore this without any past conditions because we don't want to grasp um, as, as in the instruction, it's like not, not being with what hasn't appeared yet, right? We're not, we're not with what already appeared or what hasn't appeared yet. It's just that being with what's appearing as it happens without concept. And that's, that's, that's that um, immediate felt connection with a step or the immediate felt connection with a cloud or the immediate felt connection to water, turning on water on the faucet. It, it's all this immediate felt connection with our breath where that's with air. I have this idea that, um, well, I did have an idea that maybe I could take a week um, of my daily practice to be with earth element and then a week with air, a week with, you know, fire and then a week with earth. And as I was trying to do that, I thought, I think I better do a day. You know, it, was, it was starting to feel like a week with water. Wait a minute. You know, but so I just kind of shortened it to a week with water and I don't, I don't feel like I'm mastering this um, yet, but, and I don't know if I ever would, but it's so um, interesting to just kind of, I stand still and then I, I reflect conceptually, okay, 98% of my body's water. And then I might drink some water. <laughs> or like I might flush the toilet, right? Or I might, you know, whatever, water my plants. But it's just like, it, whether it's conceptual or non-conceptual, I spend the day when there's water trying to connect more with it and feel grateful for it and appreciate it. Now, this is just new for me, but this is how I often will do my daily practice where I kind of come up with something to do um, for a while to kind of help me. Um, it's almost like what D.H. Lawrence says, but it's like it's kind of springing into more awakeness, springing into more aliveness. We often need a little help with remembering. And it, it's not just valuing springing into awakeness with pleasant or neutral things, but I, I find... Um, I know so many people that are really uh, dealing with a lot of despair and hopelessness and uh, or restlessness and boredom. It's, it's like a mix, but um, what I notice is that there's a way in which we forget that the Buddha went through such disenchantment, such despair, such hopelessness, you know, that he um, really found that out of opening to those emotions that he really um, found that yearning for freedom. And, and like a, vital, a vitality in it, not something to be moving away from, not something necessarily to always drown in. But I think um, I know for myself that, that of course I don't want to necessarily have those experiences come up. I don't think any of us would, but if we're in situations in our life, which I think a lot of people are these days, that we don't have to see them as something um, 
that's always an obstacle, but actually is a portal or a doorway um, to something deeper that's very valuable. Just like, you know, boredom is. Like boredom can be something that we just move away from and fill up with other things. But actually, we all know that if we kind of have enough time and space and enough energy to kind of go, oh, maybe I can go through this. And um, often we find something, something very valuable in our practice by going through it. And I think that we often don't, emphasize that that can happen with despair or hopelessness. I think that we talk about with helplessness and overwhelm that the Buddha taught that if that those are experiences that are so valuable because they help us to get to, um, if we can go, ah, oh, helplessness, ah, oh, you know, just that feeling of like, just uh, the heart can hurt so much. But then we get that it can be a um, doorway to compassion, to caring about pain. But, but I'd like to suggest that these other emotions that can be so difficult, um, I, I, I just read an article by Greta about Greta Thornburg who has turned 18 and who's, um, done so much for bringing awareness about climate change um, and that that you see her moving for so many years through hopelessness and despair uh, to at this point in her life online she has many like-minded friends and I've never heard her describe herself being happy but she described herself is happy because she has friends that are similar in like-mindedness. Um, and I thought that was so beautiful to watch someone so young um, go through so much despair about the world and to actually not stop um, trying to improve things and help, but that actually she's also found some friends <laughs> and uh, I think of the Sunday sitting like that I, I feel like oh there's we have a like-mindedness we might be in different places in the world we're, we're in the, these little quilt squares on the screen but also we, we share a like-mindedness where we can at least not feel alone in um in times when we need to feel more connected with um, trying to be more peaceful and loving and kind with others, that we get that support. And, and I think sometimes out of that willingness to go through things, to, to stay with things that are difficult, not all the time, but a little while, and to go see we can get through them and um, with kindness, with loving kindness, with compassion, but with wisdom and an understanding uh, that, that we can be grateful for skies. We can be graceful for the winter stars coming or friendship or f food and shelter, you know, that we often forget these basic things that we have clean enough water, that we have food shelter and um, can be grateful for patience or the unknown birth, life, death, Nibbana. I have a neighbor that gave me a plant called a coleus. I don't know if you know them, but they're not a hugely celebrated plant. It's often considered to be sort of an ordinary plant. And um, the leaves are actually beautiful. They're pink and green, but it is often in the background, uh, not that celebrated, like I said. And 
because of my injury, I don't get to garden much and a lot of the plants I love are not thriving. Uh, that's an understatement. Um, and sh this neighbor gave me a coleus plant a couple of months ago. And I was just like, hmm, this is not that exciting a plant. Though I had that idea about coleus too, but I, I thought, oh, I'll put it right in the garden because I have no, you know, I don't have much um, ability to, to garden and I know it's hardy. Uh, and after a few months, this plant, this is outside, you know, this, this plant is not only huge and beautiful, but it's, it's been flowering and it's, um, I brought some flowers in and it's one of the most beautiful flowers and plants I've ever witnessed. It's so beautiful. And I think, huh, just, I, I sent her a picture of a, a vase and flowers that I, I made with it. And um, she wrote me back and she said, do you wanna go crazy with coleus? And I said, well, what do you mean by crazy with coleus? And she said, well, I actually have a number of different kinds of coleus. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, like this whole world has opened up for me. Crazy with coleus. And I went, yes, with exclamation marks. I want to go crazy with coleus. And see, I think what I'm trying to say is life is so, it's like I sprang awake with coleus. It doesn't require hardly any effort. Um, they're very hardy. The bugs don't seem to be eating it, which is a miracle in itself. Um, and it's just, um, I'm so grateful for, uh, you know, springing awake in this way. A very celebrated plant now <laughs> in my life. Yeah, so we can celebrate despair and hopelessness and peace and happiness, dark light winter stars, summer. It's like remembering that out of the, going through the resistance into the acceptance again and again, there's more and more peace. So do you have any questions uh, about Steve's instructions, the talk, your practice? And uh, I think most of you probably know what to do, but over there in the reaction square down below on the right of your screen, you press it and up comes raise hand. David or Gloria. <laughs> Hi, Michelle, this is Gloria. And um, I just wanted to, uh, I just had an observation and reflection when you were talking about um, this uh, kind of creating um, the intention to uh, understand our experience um, with discernment instead of with judgment. And um, 
And I was just reflecting on how it rarely for myself happens in the moment, <laughs> but I think over time and with practice, it is, you know, I can, it happens after the, after the event and I'm able to, um, yeah, just look at it with different eyes and, um, and I guess my my hope is that it can inch its way closer to the actual event instead of happening, you know, so much later. Mm. It's very, uh, very heartening. I think I'm echoing, but I, is that okay? Yeah, no, you're, I, I don't hear an echo. Okay. Um. Well, you know, in a way, we're always behind because, you know, something happens and then it's the next moment, right? So it, what you're describing is just that, and I think for everyone, it, it starts to get that when we, when we first started practicing, it was like five years later, you know, two, two, two days later, you know, it's just like with a huge jet lag, right, between things to like it getting sometimes even somewhat immediate or you know delayed but i think that what what matters is that um with insight it's timeless and that when we are reflecting and understanding something in that that you're doing it in the present moment this is really critical like that we're not doing that 10 minutes ago or five days ago or two years ago, that's, you know, whether it's from when we were two days old or when we're, you know, like now, it just doesn't matter. What matters is that we're um, attending to something that um, we didn't see clearly and we, we do our best to understand it. It's really wonderful to hear. You're describing something so important and, uh, you do not want to minimize this in terms of time. <laughs> yeah. Steve, I don't know if you have something to add to that, but it's a very important question, comment. And sorry, I just want to say, Gloria, I did mute you guys just because there was like a little feedback going, but feel free to unmute yourselves back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Um. I find, I find it helpful to keep in mind that we're practicing something every moment, no matter what. So, so to, to judge things has a long history in most of our lives because the way we learned, the way we were taught, uh, the influence that, um, but that comes up when we see things that we like or don't like or people or experiences and so forth. The tendency to, to give it an assessment one way or another, I like it or dislike it, it's okay, or it's not okay. To keep in mind that that's something that we, we've practiced a lot. So that moment you had was very revealing because it actually illuminates that you have been practicing seeing things as they are for quite a number of years now. And so even though there was a lag that you described, at first you judged it by the very old habit of, of judging things or you know, analyzing things, comparing things and so forth, which, which isn't always the healthiest aspect of mind that we can cultivate. But since you've brought up, since you've brought this practice into your life, you're practicing, you know, very healthy ways of perceiving things, assessing things, using creative consciousness to, to compare things, not compare as in conceited ways, better than, worse than, or like, you know, myself, but just that, that mind that, that sees the various facets and features and characteristics and nature of something. So that's just catching up. That's what I heard from you. And in that moment, 
it caught up strongly. So you recognize it as a wisdom moment, as a discerning moment that, that cut right through the habit of judgment. I would celebrate that. Tet. Uh, tet. Hello. Um, uh, thank you for this practice. I would like to thank everyone um, because um, I joined this group fairly recently. But today's talk about, um, you know, about the feeling more connected and uh, impermanence was particularly kind of helpful. Um, and in this regard, I would like to ask, like, uh, what other recommendations you have when you start practicing it, but you still feel kind of like, you know, in order to deal with anxiety and things like that? I didn't hear the last, I didn't hear your last sentence. I'm sorry. Um, in order to, in order to. To um, work with anxiety. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And also just to let you know, Ted, I'll probably mute you just because there's also seems to be a feedback, but feel free to unmute yourself again to, to talk. Um, Anxiety is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> so um, thanks for asking about it. Um, I think both Steve and I can. Do you want to start, Steve? Or do you want me to start with the effervescence of anxiety? Um, effervescence. Effervescence of anxiety. Um, <clears throat> I, um, Ted, often there's experiences that are unpleasant that that some of them, they're easier for us than others. And so, so it might be that it's easier for you to feel, um, be mindful of sadness or happiness or, you know, the, there's a range of so many emotions. But often when there's an emotion that we have some conditioning that isn't okay, uh, that it shouldn't actually appear in our experience, then that's what makes it difficult because we're um, not able to accept that it's happening and then we can't be mindful of it because we can't accept what's happening. So, um, for example, in my um, family of origin, um, the level to which anxiety is not an acceptable experience is so intense, you know, and yet, you know, as I got older and older and, you know, did a lot of practice and I would kind of go in to visit my family, I would be amazed that like that's the most predominant thing that's happening, anxiety. You would probably say that anxiety is like operating almost all the time. And yet um, it's like not even discussed or talked about. Or, and uh, so, of course, my conditioning is that when anxiety would appear, um, I wouldn't be able to be with it. I would just think it's not okay. And I remember the first time on a retreat when um, I was actually outside doing walking meditation. And, you know, I'd been struggling and push caught in a story about something and pushing it, pushing the anxiety away as usual. And I remember just standing there and for a while and going, oh, I'm afraid. It's okay. I remember that so vividly because it was so huge a change, like that it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. And then it's like out of that place of like whatever it is, it's difficult for us, but it's like when we can go, oh, <laughs> despair or like whatever, you know, 
rage, whatever it is, it's difficult. But in this case, you're asking about anxiety, but it is a similar process where if there can be that shift, uh, then you see what the experience feels like in your body, the corresponding physical sensations. And um, this can be, if it's a hard thing to be with, which I learned a lot from being with this, sometimes I go to sound for a while and then I shift to the experience, the corresponding physical sensations in my body. Often there's a constriction in my heart. My heart is beating faster. Um, maybe I'll go to my hands, the sensations in my hands for a while, then come back to um, the corresponding physical sensations. I hope you get the feeling. You kind of go to things that are more neutral, bottom of the feet, body, sound, body, kind of allowing, allowing, allowing what's there. Um, and I would say that sometimes I'm, I'm saying something about effervescence, but because if I'm totally accepting anxiety, it kind of feels like an effervescent um, energetics. You know, it's like somebody kind of put a little hose into my um, arm or something and they injected um, effervescence. It's just so, um, there's voltage to it and it's intense, but when I'm really that clear, I'll be like, oh, I don't call it anxiety anymore. I call it, oh, it's effervescence, you know? And I still might ground the attention with the feet, ground the attention with the hands, ground the attention with the um, sound, but I'm careful about getting too caught in whatever the anxiety is about, right? It's, it's not about it's, I, don't, I don't get so caught in fixing things or doing something about the anxiety, but just pulling back to the experience and letting it come and go by itself. That's kind of a, a short answer. Okay, okay, I understand, thank you. Yeah, Steve, did you, yeah, no, this is, Ted, this is a, this could be a 20 hour description, so. Yes, <laughs> I don't we just know. started, right? <laughs> yeah, we're just starting. <laughs> Maybe Steve has something to say. Well, I just, I listened to you, Michelle, <laughs> and I, I, um, I had the desire to go get an effervescent drink, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but then I just uh, sort of, I just followed what you were saying, and in the same spirit that Gloria was talking about, realizing that her habit of judging something fell away in a moment of wisdom or discernment. Uh, I, 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 I practice anxiety. <laughs> I intentionally practice anxiety, just listening really carefully to you say all the things that you've done and how well you knew anxiety and things that, and ways you've worked with it before. I felt it, in, I felt it as energy in the lower part of my body and in my hands, and then anchored in my hands and anchored in my feet and just went through exactly what you were talking about and seeing that the, the body can be an extraordinary um, container to experience anything pleasant or in this case, fairly unpleasant and just be with it and see its effervescence, which is continually changing and seeing that as like disconnecting with a Nietzsche, with change, with the truth. And so that took some of the sting and some of the dread, some of the fear away. It, when, when you named it fear, that was even more helpful, you know, coming under that category, greed, hatred, delusion, the, the category of, of uh, ill will, and anxiousness and, and fear and dread and so forth. Went through all of that. Perfectly. So thank you. You're welcome. It was a good practice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I also just, Ted, I don't know how much you've listened to what, what we say, but it's also good to move away from it if it's too, if it's, if you're drowning in it, I think that the kind of grounding the attention with something stronger I mean, for me, it's, I, I understand it so much in myself. I get so ground, ungrounded if I'm starting to worry about the future in some way, in whatever way it's happening. Um, 
I have a cement driveway. I might just lie on the driveway, right? <laughs> you know, really, I, I, because it's so hard, right? And it's so strong. It's so it takes my attention, right? Or I might hold a tree, the trunk of a tree, or go for a fast walk and look at the neighbors' houses, or you know, just anything to kind of not drown in it. And and then maybe once in a while just say it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's like most of my life I ran from it, you know. So it's like allowing that feeling of like it's okay to run, but kind of maybe going to the bottom of my feet or my hands and coming back to more just uh, earth. Earth element is really the best to ground it. And then, then maybe you can take some breath and earth element. And then you re really, once you kind of look around and see the sky and clouds and, you know, maybe a neighbor's cat, you just kind of start getting that you are okay, that it is okay. And you I don't see. have, to, yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, yeah, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> Where are you, by the way? Uh, I'm in Oahu, Hawaii. Where? Oh, Waikiki. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Ted. Hello over there. <laughs> <laughs> I can wave. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Great. Is that Arlene? Are you, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Hi. To continue um, on the subject, um, this, there has been a crisis that has that happened about three months ago, and what I, in my mind, the scenario continues. It kind of visits like um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and. Since um, wisdom has taught me to not do what I normally do, which is when I'm tense and I'm the one who fixes everything, okay? Uh, or, and gets, you know, and fixes everything out of the impulse of anxiety, not, more than, oh, I'm going to, in this case, it's definitely the impulse of what's happening in my body. So what I have been doing in the past two or three, two months is kind of watching this thing repeat. And um, when it does, it, I, I open to incredible sadness and sobbing sometimes. And then there's always this um, awareness of that I could do something and perhaps make it better, okay? But wisdom tells me that for myself, it, it, even if I do something, I'm waiting for a reaction and that creates more tension. And also, um, so what during this meditation and you know, through the days, what usually is happening is the thought is there and you know, I want it to go away or whatever, but then I go to my body and I feel um, the pain. And in this meditation, in the beginning of this, I kind of opened to, uh, you know, caring about the body or feeling the breath move through the body. And then as the talk, you're talking, I got in, in touch with this tension within my body. 
And it's a familiar tension, which is even before anybody talked about it, I never thought of it. It was just judgmentally that I'm a you know bad meditator because you know, blah, 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 blah. And just feeling the tension run through uh, my veins and allowing myself, a lot of it is I don't allow myself to do good things. So allowing myself to move and to, uh, as I watch the judgment or why is this thing happening? So I think I've become more comfortable with the sadness and the sobbing and more as I am not trying, I am not reacting, I am not trying to reach out and make everything better. I am experiencing more of, um, and of the anxiety and the, the, the tension going up and down my body and the wanting, you know, I mean, I could turn on the news or Michelle has fairy tales. Well, why don't I find something, you know, and, and nothing seems to be working. So I guess I, I guess opening to just the tension, the, the vibration, I, I'd like help. <laughs> uh, Steve, you want me to start? I I think I sure. have somewhere. Yeah. Um, I personally think you're amazing and that you're doing incredibly. I just want to say that. And um, often like with, with PTSD that there's some level where the, the thread of the storyline um, the anxiety tends to get more intense as we move further and further away from accepting that the origin of the trauma happened, right? Like there's whatever bomb goes off that we would call trauma, um, there's a way in which that um, pain in the heart is kind of screaming for j just the reality of not condoning it happened, but that it happened, which is very difficult, very difficult in and of itself, just that this is the um, hard part with trauma is just that, uh, that accepting of a certain level of pain will feel unacceptable. <laughs> and so if you, there's a dr dance that goes on where we're accepting it, we'll feel like condoning it. And it, it's like, there's so much tension in the body because there's also the wanting to do something about it, which all of that is natural. And if that's your inclination, then the whole thing will snowball into, um, for you, uh, <clears throat> The old pattern is to do something with the anxiety, right? Right. And the, the new wisdom is telling you to stop and feel this, but it's like the more you stop and feel it, I can guarantee you the more anxiety you're going to feel. <laughs> No, it's just I know it from the I know it from the back of my hand. That's where I came from. You know, this is this is the whole thing. Why is everybody in my family so anxious? Well, they're all trying to run away from trauma. <laughs> it's just like, you know, and so I know it really well. You know, everybody has their way of dealing with it. But just to just pace it, Arlene, you got to just pace it, pace it, pace it, pace it, pace it, <laughs> you know, pace it, pace it. If it's not a stuffed animal or a fairy tale or, you know, out for another 5,000 mile walk, you know what, you know what I mean? Just right. like uh, there's ways in which you, 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 you're doing it. That's why I'm applauding you. You're doing a, a little bit of it, but please don't expect too much. That's nothing about a bad yogi. It's about pacing healing from trauma. It's a whole other level of work. And so just to be careful of, um, often what might work yesterday doesn't always work 
today I, or tomorrow. I, so I, I think, think I think the as you were talking, I was really realizing. I mean, in my family of origin, but in in my life, I've always been the one who kind of says blah, 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 or do this, and I think that I've let go of that. But I think I'm. I see myself doing it to myself. Right, and that's the so, willpower. The will you have, if you survive, I know you, if you've survived, the, your willpower is so strong. And so that sh you're shifting out of that whole way of being. And there's another part of you that's going to go, wait a minute. You know, I actually, like, I actually like this part of me that can fix this, right? And to do this, and you're not. Yeah, right? so that's true. It's amazing. You know, it's so you're, I, energy. I, I, you have all the tools and it's, it's uh, you know, if the news doesn't work that well, it might I'll work. I'll find something. Right. right. No, I think you will. I trust that you will. I, I think it's more just my encouragement is to um, really, you know, I, I kind of want to scream, please don't be hard on yourself on top of everything else. Just like stop that. You know, it's that bad mother, right? That just oh, like, I, 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 comes I, I, in, I right? Know. And so like that, that muscle, that weak muscle of meta. If she, if that, she isn't there, watch out and be careful and do everything you can or reach out to know that you're a good person and you're doing good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Good to see you, both of you. <laughs> yeah, hard. Something, some things take the wind out of us. I know when I feel that the wind's been taking out of me, I still notice I'm breathing. <laughs> I think there are many beautiful, simple things that we can do. I know where Steve is living now, there's a, a little garden out front that is his to take care of. And um, I notice that he'll plant seeds there or water there, or just like come out and, you know, at odd times, but just not always regular, but, you know, in a little walk, it doesn't have to be a big walk, but a little walk to a nice place. Or um, I know for myself, it's uh, with my injury, I'll think, oh, I, Maybe I'm never going to go on the walk I used to walk, but um, I'm finding that it's amazing. I don't know how many months, but it's it's like I'm walking in a very small area, and I used to walk very far, just very small, back and forth. And um, I don't even think it's weird anymore. You know, it's it's just uh, this is this is it. And I, I think that as our lives changes and things happen, um, I think we find new ways of being that support our, our practice and our life that um, are often surprising, like the coleus flowers. Or, um, I know last year, Steve, you planted strawberries, remember, in oh, Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, on sea level, strawberries in Hawaii, but we do all these interesting things that you wouldn't even think they would have grown. And um, I don't know, Steve, if you have anything else to offer on that level, but. Uh... I plant things and leave them alone. <laughs> yeah, if the conditions are right, and I see little green things come up after a while. So my latest was, uh, uh, I saw the sweet potatoes growing roots in the kitchen because I forgot about them. So <laughs> I, I buried them. I buried them and now I put water on them and do nothing. 
Jesse has planted these huge squash in, in the yard and I've never seen them grow here at sea level. So it's like, I think in these uncertain times, we all do these very interesting things, right? And, uh, you know, um, some of them don't work out the way we think they should, but other things do are really sprouting in our lives and growing. And uh, I think we feel, we need to feel very heartened by that. <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna get a big squash, but we have beautiful plant all over the yard. It's really fun, you know. That squash planted itself. I didn't do oh, that. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> not, not, a, not a statement. It's a, right, right. Uh, yeah. And Steve, if you get sweet potatoes, we'll fly over and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it okay if I just make a quick announcement? Yeah, I'll see. Sure. Just, um, I'm going to type it in here into the chat that I just finally have posted a bunch of the talks from our June retreat uh, up on our YouTube channel. So those are now available and I'll try to be better uh, from this point on about kind of getting uh, older talks that we've given on from our online courses back up on um, online and available just publicly. So there's that link. It's just where we have a bunch of our YouTube stuff, but there's a, a bunch of good talks from the June retreat and I'll try to get last January's up soon. Um, I can <laughs> mine them from the depths. So. Thanks. And we'll be sending an email out soon about sort of like some upcoming programs and um, with this and a little methadona update and stuff as well. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jesse. Thank everybody. Thank you for your practice. <laughs>